I understand that you, you know, the uh, physiology of it, if, if you will, but it had, to, it had to come from somewhere. And that is the leap of faith that you guys make, that it just happened. Well, a leap of faith, you don't actually need a leap of faith. You, you're the one who needs a leap of faith because you are actually, you, the onus is on you to say why you, do, you believe in something. There's an infinite number of gods you could believe in. I take it you don't believe in Zeus or Apollo or Thor. You believe in presumably the Jesus. Christian god, Jesus. So Jesus was yeah. a real guy. But, I could see him. Yeah. You know, and I know what he did. And so I'm not positive that Jesus is God, but I'm throwing in with Jesus rather than throwing in with you guys because you guys can't tell me how it all got here. You guys don't know. We're working on it. Physicists are oh, working. When you get it, then maybe I'll listen. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, if you look at the history of science over the, over the centuries, yeah. the amount that's, that's gained in knowledge each century is stupendous. In the beginning of the 21st century, we don't know everything. We have to be humble. We have to, in humility, say that there's a lot that we still don't know. And, you know, being humble is a Christian virtue. Now, I am uh, absolutely convinced that the main source of hatred in the world is religion and organized religion. Absolutely convinced of it. And I think it should be religion treated with ridicule and hatred and contempt. And I claim that right. You suck. Go burn in hell. Satan will enjoy torturing you. What happened? Mum didn't pay enough attention to you, so you decided to rebel. I hope for your own sake you see your grave mistake and repent. God dwells among us every day. You are the spawn of evil. Christian living for God. <laughs> I hope you die slowly and you fucking burn in hell, you damn blasphemy. What about the most important minority in the history of the world? Those who have never believed in God, those who believe that an ethical life is possible without religion. We have to be insulted and outraged every day by what we see, what we read. By slaughter and murder. Slaughter and murder and barbarism and insult and, and superstitious nonsense. We do not reply in kind. We don't say, we'll go and kill you if you go on insulting us like this. Do we get no credit? for saying this? When, when has anyone ever said, what's it like to be insulted as someone who thinks that civilization is a real thing? Why is it always interfaith? Why is it always interdenominational? Why can't we say that all of these cults are equal and equivalent glimpses of the untrue? This is probably going to be the most simplest one for you to answer, but what if you're wrong? Well, what if I'm wrong? I mean, anybody could be wrong. We could all be wrong about the flying spaghetti monster and the pink unicorn and the flying teapot. Um, you happen to have been brought up, I would presume, in the Christian faith. You know what it's like not to believe in a particular faith because you're not a Muslim. You're not a Hindu. Why aren't you a Hindu? Because you happen to have been brought up in America, not in India. If you'd been brought up in, Indo in India, you'd be a Hindu. If you were brought up in... in um, Denmark in the time of the Vikings, you'd be believing in Wotan and Thor. If you were brought up in, in classical Greece, you'd be believing in, in Zeus. If you were brought up in Central Africa, you'd be believing in the great Juju up the mountain. I mean, there's no particular reason to pick on the Judeo-Christian God in which by the sheerest accident you happen to have been brought up and, and ask me the question, what if I'm wrong? What if you're wrong about the great Juju at the bottom of the sea? Um, until 1979, you couldn't be black and be a deacon or an elder of the Mormon Church. You're an elder. You certainly couldn't be an elder. You couldn't be, play any role in it at all. It was an officially racist organization. Um, Senator Birds had to answer questions about that. He was a Klansman in his youth. Um, Mitt Romney was a, was a grown man in 1979. He should be asked, what, he, what, he, what, what was it like being a member of an officially racist organization? In what way are you glad that's changed, if you are glad? Um, don't say 
stop saying that we're not allowed to ask these questions and that it's un-American to ask. The Mormons had to be told they were un-American when they practiced polygamy and weren't allowed to have Utah as a state of the union until they changed on that. It's, it's blowing smoke to have told us that he thinks the Garden of Eden used to be in Missouri and will be again after Jesus of Nazareth returns and splits the Mount of Olives in two. Um, well, I mean, I think that's a crackpot belief. It doesn't have any dangerous implication. The critical thing is the Mormon Church was an officially racist organization while he was an adult. That's very important. Um, you suggested that uh, Mormons are... Um, uh, the the, the, the toss-up is whether... Yes. Um, I mean, the, the Mormon religion is so obviously fake founded by a transparent charlatan in the 19th century, Joseph Smith. I mean, nothing could be more obvious than that that man was a fake and a charlatan and a liar. And yet now we have a presidential candidate who is prepared to say that he believes in this mountebank, who wrote a bogus book, the Book of Mormon, although he was writing in the 19th century, chose to write it in 17th century English. I mean, why don't people see through that? I just can't understand it. Um, but anyway, um, that was a digression, right? Don't say, look, you, what, here's, do, yourself okay. and your, do yourself and your faith the honor of saying it's faith. Don't no, 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 say no. science-based. The argument you would won't be... get away with it. Look, the argument would be, Christopher, is that if the universe exploded into being out of nothing, then miracles are possible because the greatest miracle of all has already occurred. The question is, have miracles occurred in the first century? No, miracle, that requires another debate whereby we have to look at the historical evidence and see. And if it is true that, the, uh, that Jesus really did come and say and do the things that the New Testament writer said he did, then whatever he teaches is true because if he rose from the dead, he was God. If he taught that there will be an intervention, then there will be. That's the argument. I don't have time to support it. Now, a sentence or two from David Hume would, would correct what you said. A, a miracle is defined not as a part of the natural order, but as a suspension of the natural no, order. No, an intervention. Can't, you, can't say, you can't say of, a, of the Big Bang, which is the foundation of the natural order, that it's a suspension of what it starts. You may not do that. However, if you meet someone in the street who you yesterday saw executed, you can say either that an extraordinary miracle has occurred or that you are under a very grave misapprehension. And David Hume's logic on this, I think, is quite irrefutable. He says, what is more likely, that the laws of nature have been suspended in your favor and in a way that you approve, or that you've made a mistake? And in each case, you must, start, and especially if you didn't see it yourself and you're hearing it from someone who says that they did. I would go further and say the following. I'll grant you that it would be possible to track the pregnancy of the woman Mary, who's mentioned about three times in the Bible, uh, and to show that there was no male intervention in her life at all. But yet she delivered herself of a healthy baby boy. I can say, I, I don't say that's impossible. Parthenogenesis is not completely unthinkable, but it does not prove that his paternity is divine. And it wouldn't prove that any of his moral teachings were thereby correct. Nor, if I was to see him executed one day and see him walking the streets the next, would that show that his father was God, or his mother was a virgin, or that his teachings were true? Especially given the commonplace nature of resurrection at that time and place. After all, Lazarus was raised, never said a word about it. The daughter of Jairus was raised, didn't say a thing about what she'd been through. Um, and the Gospels tell us that at the time of the crucifixion, all the graves in Jerusalem opened and their occupants wandered around the streets to greet. So that the resurrection was something of a banality at the time. Not all, not all of those people clearly were divinely uh, conceived. So I'll, I'll give you all the miracles and you'll still be left exactly where you are now, holding an empty sack. I'm sticking with Judeo-Christian philosophy and my religion of Roman Catholicism because it helps me as a person. Ah, oh, that's different. If it, you know, if helps, it helps you, absolutely. Great. And that doesn't it, mean it's true. And, yeah. Well, it's true for me. You see, I, I believe... You mean true for you is different from true for anybody else? Have yeah, something to be absolutely, true for you? because I can't Some prove... Some things either got to be true or not. I can't... No, no. I can't prove to you that Jesus is God. 
So that truth is mine and mine alone. But you can't prove to me that Jesus is not. So you have to stay in your little belief system. You can't prove system. that Zeus is not. You can't prove that Apollo is not. Or well, I saw Apollo, man. He's the, he was down there. He's not looking good. Now, now the first question obviously is for you, Christopher. Uh, since Mr. McGrath has just finished, I would put the question to you, which is, if, if God does not exist, on what basis can anyone say this action is right or this action is wrong? So whoever asked that only just came into the room, right? I, mean, I can't believe that I didn't say what I thought about it. But, but I won't repeat it because actually what Dr. McGrath just said, I thought was unusually good on this point. You'll recall what he said on the Dostoevsky matter. Um, if God exists, we have to do what he says. If he doesn't, we can do what we like. Now, just apply this for a second in practice and in theory. Um, is it not said of God's chosen people, and is it not said to, uh, to them by God in the Pentateuch that they can do exactly as they like to other people? They can enslave them, they can take their land, they can take their women, they can destroy all their young men, they can help themselves to all their virgins, they can do what anyone who had no sense of anything but their, their own rights would be able to do, but in this case with divine permission. Doesn't that make it somewhat more evil? In Iran, where I've been, I've been to all three axes of evil countries, uh, by the way, and I think I'm the only writer who can say that. You're not allowed to sentence a woman who is a virgin to death, even though she may have committed, in the eyes of the mullahs, a capital crime, perhaps by showing her hair too often or her limbs. She can't be sentenced to death. But religious law means she can be raped by the revolutionary guards and she's not a virgin anymore. And then they can kill her. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, used to be considered the motto of Satanism, as I recall. Divine permission given to people who think they have God on their side enables actions that a normal, morally normal unbeliever would not contemplate the mutilation of genitalia of children. Who would do that if it wasn't decided that God wanted it? Just as when the poet in England gets the poet laureate ship, they start to write drivel instead of poetry for some reason. It's the, it's the king's scrofula the other way around. Morally normal and intelligent people find themselves saying fatuously wicked things when this subject comes up. The suicide bombing community is entirely faith-based. The genital mutilation community is entirely faith-based. Slavery is mandated by the Bible. People keep, you keep hearing how many abolitionists were Christians. Well, it was about time that they took a stand against it, having mandated it for so long. So it's, 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 it's not even a tautology, I think, to say that there's, a, that, uh, there's a, a relationship between the human impulse to do evil, to be selfish, to be self-centered, to be greedy, and a co contrast between that and faith, because given only faith, mountains can be moved, and millions of people who would never normally acquiesce in evil are brought to it straight away and with ease and with self-righteousness. There. That's my answer to that. And, and the questioner did not answer my challenge. Name an ethical statement made or action performed by a believer in the name of faith that couldn't have been by an, an infidel and name, if you can, this is easier, a wicked action that could only be mandated by faith and then you'll see how silly your question was, whoever you were.